And good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, before we get into uh, my continuation of my review and re refutation of Mr. Kyle Pope's book, Thinking About AD 70, uh, I want to make a very special request of you, my viewers, to consider supporting our ministry. The, the COVID pandemic has been absolutely brutal to our regular monthly support. We have lost several hundred dollars in regular monthly support. My wife and I continue to try to cut back on our expenses and what have you. Uh, we, we are thrifty people. We are absolutely not extravagant. And so the loss of this significant amount of money in our monthly support uh, has been very, 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 very troublesome. So we need to ask you, if you, as you can, and I know things are a little difficult for everyone, but if you have the capability and the desire, if you, if you like what we are doing and we're bringing you here on Morning Musings and on Now TV, thankfully we had a very generous contribution. Uh, our Now TV uh, payments through the rest of this year are paid up. And so that's an absolute blessing for us. But guess what? We have every single month expenses otherwise. And we need you to help us with that. If you want more information on that, and how you can help us, then please contact me through my websites and I'll be able to give you any information that you want. And I appreciate so very, very much any support that you can give us. It is important. And right now it's necessary. Okay? So, back to our review and refutation of Mr. Kyle Pope's book, again, Thinking About AD 70. Now, on page 64 and following, he is actually discussing the subject of the gathering, the, the end time gathering. He goes out of his way in passage after passage to prove that the Old Testament prophecies as well as the new, in many of the passages that speak of the gathering, he speaks of that as an already accomplished reality. Pardon me, it almost seems that Mr. Pope has no concept of the already, but the not yet. And so as a result of this, he comes to passages that talks about the gathering, and he says, well, that began at Pentecost. Well, again, it, yeah, it took place at Pentecost, but he wants to make that as an already reality over and done with. Therefore, in passages that talk about the eschatological coming, such as Romans chapter 11, he goes, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 11, he goes to Isaiah chapter 11 and says, see, that was done on Pentecost, over and done. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. It wasn't over and done. So then he comes to examine Romans chapter 11, 25 through 27. And uh, he, I, I have to tell you, and I'm, I'm not trying to be unkind whatsoever. I want to be as respectful as, as possible uh, to Mr. Pope, everything that I know of him. He seems to be a nice guy. Uh, he admits that Paul is talking about the righteous remnant and the salvation of the remnant. But he, he talks about how Paul said Israel had already been cast off. Now, I want you to hang on that because he wants us to believe and he tries to convince us that, that Paul was teaching Israel had already been completely cast off. And that was at the cross. Well, there are two major problems with that. Number one, Mr. Pope says this on page 65. Israel, according to the flesh, had been cast away. And this had already allowed for the reconciling of the world. Compare Romans 5, 10 through 11, a present condition. Well, if the world had already been reconciled to Christ, then why will Mr. Pope go ahead to say that 
that reconciling continues until the end of time. Oh, it's an already but not yet then. So on the one hand, he says, oh, Israel's already been cut off. The world has already been reconciled. Oh, but wait a minute. Uh, the salvation of Israel will continue throughout the Christian age as any and every Jew that is converted to Christ is saved and the world is reconciled to Christ as people continue to be uh, converted to Christ. That's an already but a not yet that Mr. Pope seems to be rejecting. On the one hand, he wants to say, already done. On the other hand, he puts it out here in the future at the end of time. That's a contradiction of his own statements. But then he says, uh, because of unbelief, they, that's Israel, were broken off, Romans 11, 19. While A.D. 70 would be a judgment on Israel, those who refused to believe uh, in Messiah were already cast away and broken off. And he asked, why were they cast away? And he says, Paul continues, because of unbelief. Well, <laughs> again, uh, more already but not yet, but here's a crucial factor. Remember, Paul is talking about Israel's rejection of the gospel. In chapter 10, that's what he is talking about. Have they not heard? Yes, they've heard. Well, how can they hear except there be a preacher? Well, how can there be a preacher except he be sent? Has Israel not heard? Yes, their sound, the sound of the preachers, has gone out into all the world. Therefore, they're without excuse. He's talking about the preaching of the gospel and Israel's rejection of the gospel. It is that unbelief that is the focus of Paul's discussion. Well, Houston, we have a problem. We have a, a problem for the view that says, per Mr. Pope, Israel was cut off at the cross. Okay, examine this. Israel was cut off at the, at the cross, according to Kyle Pope. But <clears throat> Israel was cut off for unbelief, says Paul, Romans eleven nineteen. Therefore, well, let me give one more proposition here. Israel was cut off for unbelief and rejection of the gospel of Christ, said Paul. Therefore, Israel was cut off at the cross for rejecting the gospel. But wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. The gospel was not preached until after the cross. And thus you cannot take Paul's statement about they were cut off for unbelief and apply it retroactively, anachronistically to the cross. Was Israel in a state of unbelief when Paul wrote? Yes, they were. Because he would go ahead, go ahead to say in Romans 11, verse 28, they are enemies of God for the sake of the gospel. Why? Well, because they were in that, at that time rejecting the gospel as a corporate body. And yet they're beloved for the promise's sake. Again, Romans 11, 28. But there's a second issue here, as I suggested a moment ago, that Mr. Pope is completely overlooking or perhaps ignoring. It was not simply Israel's unbelief of the gospel, which, again, Mr. Pope is anachronistically uh, applying to the cross. He is ignoring the fact that in Galatians chapter 4, 22 and following, Paul addresses and he gives his great allegory of Abraham and Isaac, of Hagar and Ishmael. And he says, there are two women. One is a bondwoman, one is a free. One is the wife, one's the concubine. These two women represent two mountains and two covenants. These two so uh, the, and these two sons represent the two covenants. And Paul said, concerning Hagar and Ishmael, 
as it was then in the time of Abraham, in the time of Hagar and Ishmael, the children of the flesh persecuted, catch the power of that, persecuted the children or the son of the free woman. So what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. So what does Paul teach us in Galatians chapter 4? He teaches us <clears throat> that Israel was to be finally cast out. <clears throat> was she filling up the measure of her sin and rebellion by rejecting the gospel, i.e., when Paul wrote, sure was. But her final rejection would come as a result, please pay attention, please catch the power of this, Israel's final rejection would come <coughs> because of her persecution of the children of the promise, i.e., Christians. Well, Jewish persecution of the church didn't even begin until Acts chapter 8. So since Israel was to be cast out, not only for unbelief, but that unbelief leading to persecution of the church. And since Israel did not begin <clears throat> persecuting the church for a good little while after the church was established, then guess what? Israel was not cast off at the cross. And that brings me, <clears throat> got to shift gears here ever so slightly. Uh, so Mr. Mr. Pope goes ahead to say, that the, the coming of the Redeemer out of Zion, and let, let me just start here, and he says this grafting in of the Gentiles and the grafting in, the regrafting of Israel is not a corporate reality. Just as belief and unbelief is not a collective measure of one's relationship to God. Individual Jews, according to the flesh, who accept Jesus as Messiah can be included within the remnant that was already gathered upon the proclamation of the gospel. No, ladies and gentlemen, Romans chapter 9, as Paul discusses the salvation, the gathering of the remnant, he says, a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Not has made, but will make. He will cut that work short in righteousness. He will. He will. Mr. Pope is ignoring what Paul said about the salvation of the remnant. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, has God cast away his people? Well, God forbid. Well, Mr. Pope says, yes, he had. Was there an already but not yet at work? Yes, there was. But Mr. Pope wants to make the casting away a definitive punctiliary, punctiliary event at the cross when Paul says, guess what? There is, at this present time, a remnant, according to grace and according to faith, and the salvation of the remnant was not completed, ladies and gentlemen. And then Mr. Pope contradicts himself. Let me go ahead. This is how all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Romans 11, quoting Isaiah 59, 20, 21. Uh, well, it's kind of convenient that he overlooks the fact or conveniently ignores the fact that he also quotes from Isaiah chapter 20, as virtually all scholars agree. Christ was this deliverer. The sacrifice of sins was offered at the cross, and the true remnant of Israel that will be saved are, are those who accept and obey the gospel. So you see, on the one hand, he says the remnant had been saved. Now he's telling us that the remnant are those who will obey the gospel. This was a gathering that was already happening long before A.D. 70. Well, yeah, it was happening. That's my point, but it refutes his own statement that the remnant had already been gathered. Mr. Pope goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So, the gathering of Jeremiah 31 and 10 
of this remnant, Jeremiah 31, 7, must be understood in this same way. It would not be a gathering in A.D. 70. It had already begun, <laughs> begun, yes, at that time. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's the problem. Mr. Pope, on the one hand, says the gathering had already taken place. Pardon me. Just like he says, Israel had been broken off, cast off at the cross. Then he turns around and says the gathering is still taking place because Christ was a redeemer and he shed his blood on the cross for redemption. No one denies that. So on the one hand, he wants it a done deal. Then he, then he wants it not a done deal. And that as any individual Jew is converted to Christ, he becomes a part of that righteous remnant and, and the consummation of the salvation of the righteous remnant takes place at the end of time. Now, let me point something out and I've got to hurry here. I took note of the fact that Mr. Pope conveniently, conveniently omitted the fact that Paul, in Romans 11, 26 and 27, all Israel shall be saved, for as it is written, the Redeemer shall come out of Zion, for this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sin. Paul quotes not only from Jeremiah 31, which he certainly does, but he quotes from Isaiah 27 and... Isaiah 59. Now look, I know it's common. It is common in the amillennial world. Kim Riddlebarger, uh, in defense of amillennialism, takes this view. Many other commentators take the view that, that this coming of the Lord out of Zion is a reference to the personal ministry of Christ and the subsequent preaching of the gospel throughout the entirety of the Christian age. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that will not happen work. So let me set forth this argument for your consideration and then verify it by, by an exegesis of Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59. The coming of the Lord out of Zion for the redemption and the salvation of Israel, for the taking away of Israel's sin, would be in fulfillment of Isaiah 27, Isaiah 59, and Jeremiah 31. I'm going to focus on Isaiah 27 and 59. But the prophecies of the salvation of Israel, the salvation of the remnant of Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59 are predictions of the time of Israel's salvation, the salvation of the remnant, at the time of the judgment of Israel, pay attention, for shedding innocent blood. Now let me ask you, did that take place at the cross? You know it didn't. Jesus said the vindication of all the blood of all the righteous would take place in his generation in the judgment of Jerusalem, not at the cross. The cross would need to be vindicated and was vindicated in the judgment of those who put him on the cross. Isaiah 27. Now look, Isaiah 24 through 28 maybe even chapter 29, is a united discourse. It's called the Little Apocalypse. I do not have time to develop this uh, in depth, but the Lord ponders through, it, through Isaiah, has he, that's Yahweh, struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Has the Lord punished Israel like he punished the nations that punished Israel? And he says, or has he, that's Israel, has he been slain according to the, to the slaughter of those who were slain by him, by the, slain by the Lord? And the answer to that is, yes, Israel has been slain, but watch this, in measure. Well, how do you sort of kind of in measure kill somebody if we're talking about individuals? But, but it's not talking about individuals, talking about Israel, the corporate body. In measure, he has killed it by sending it, the nation, away. How did God kill Israel in measure? By sending her away into captivity. Now watch this. 
You contended with it. He, re he removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Now, please, please catch this. Therefore, by this, by what? By sending Israel into captivity, by judging her, by killing her, in measure, because you see, he wouldn't kill the righteous remnant. By this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And I know people generally jump up about this time and say, Preston, you cannot be right because it's through the power of the cross that Israel would be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not the one that inspired the words to be written that says, by this, by what? By the judgment of Israel by the slaying of Israel. By this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. This is the fruit of the taking away his sin. So, is Isaiah denying that the cross would be the means for taking away Israel, of Israel's sin? No. Is he also affirming that the power of the blood of Christ would be applied through the judgment and through the application of that blood to the righteous remnant at the time of this judgment. Now watch this. He's going to describe this judgment for us. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. This is the fruit of the taking away of his sin. When, okay, Lord, when are you going to take away his sin? Oh, Mr. Pope would tell us, that's at the cross. No, he can't even take that position because he doesn't believe that anyone's sin is taken away until a person hears the gospel and obeys the gospel, and he believes that that takes place throughout the entirety of the Christian age, listen to me, having nothing whatsoever to do with the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to Israel because after all, Mr. Pope believes that God was through with Israel. He believes that God was through with the Old Testament. You know, Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59, God was through with those promises at the cross. And yet he applies Isaiah 27, he applies Isaiah 59 to the continuous, ongoing, unending fulfillment of Isaiah 27 and 59 through evangelism and the conversion of individual Jews. Individual Jews are not the focus of Isaiah 27. Has he slain Israel? Israel, corporate. Yes, he has done that. He has slain Israel, corporate, in measure by sending it or her away. When would this be applied? When would this salvation come? It is not at the cross. It is not in an ongoing evangelism and conversion of individual Christians or individual Jews. When he makes the stones of the altar like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense and altars shall not stand. Yet, the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken, and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed, there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its bows are withered, they will be broken off. The women come and set them on fire. For, you see that connective particle? For it is a people. Well, who is the people? It's the people that he killed in measure. Israel. For it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, the one who made them will not have mercy on them. And the one who formed them will show no favor to them. And it shall come to pass in that day. In what day? The destruction of the temple, the destruction of the altar, the destruction of the city, the destruction of the people whom the Lord had created, the people of no understanding would, would no longer find mercy. Now listen to me, that can't be the church, right? Now watch, 
So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. They who are outcast in the land of Egypt shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. Oh, you, you remember the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 12, 21, follow him. You have come to Mount Zion. This is the gathering. I've got a lot on that. But let me point this out. This is a people of no understanding. Yahweh is predicting the destruction of that people. But here's what you've got to understand. This is a direct citation from Deuteronomy 32 and verse 18, in which Yahweh speaks of Israel in her last, pardon me, days. So here is Isaiah 27 predicting the destruction of this people of no understanding in her last days, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And Isaiah 27 is predicting that at that time, this people of no understanding would, would no longer receive mercy and her city, her temple, and her altar would be destroyed and it would be then that the Lord would take away their sin. Whose sin? The sin of the remnant. Who would turn to him in righteousness? And so when Mr. Kyle Pope attempts to make Paul be saying that, well, the Redeemer shall come out of Zion, that's the cross, and take away their sin, that's the preaching of the gospel throughout the entirety of the Christian age. And when any individual Jew is converted and obeys the gospel, that is a fulfillment of Isaiah 27 and 59. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, let, let me reiterate this for emphasis sake. Mr. Kyle Pope says the entirety of the old law passed away at the, at the cross. God says, or Mr. Pope says, God was through with Israel at the cross. He tells us that the remnant had already been gathered. But then he turns around and says, well, no, it not really. Not re it hasn't really been gathered because it will not be gathered until the end of time. The confusion on the part of the amillennial world, and Mr. Pope is a representative of that, concerning Romans chapter 11 is incredible. Let me close by giving this argument in more refined form. The salvation of Israel in fulfillment of Romans chapter 11, 26 and 27 would be the salvation of Israel foretold by Isaiah 27. Going to have to pick up Isaiah 59 in the next video. But So the salvation of Israel, Romans chapter 11, would be the salvation of Israel foretold by Isaiah 27. But the salvation of Israel foretold by Isaiah 27, 10 and following, would take place when, when, catch the power of it, when the altar of the temple would be turned to chalk stone, the temple would be destroyed, the city, the fortified city would be destroyed, the, the people of no understanding, i.e. old covenant Israel, those who were disobedient, would be destroyed. But those who obeyed, you know, the part that were not slain, the righteous remnant, they would receive their salvation. And Paul said in Romans chapter 9, verse 28, that salvation of the remnant would not be a long, drawn-out process like Mr. Pope affirms. It would take place at the coming of the Lord. Not the cross, not throughout the Christian age, but at the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the full casting out of old covenant Israel. Listen, you need to get a copy of my book and do not forget that we have, uh, I have a fantastic special going on for the rest of this month. October 2021. Seventy weeks are determined for the resurrection, and Elijah has come, a solution 
to Romans 11, 25 to 27. Everything that I've shared with you this morning and a ton more is to be found in this book. And seal up vision and prophecy. Now, if you bought each one of those books separately and paid separate shipping, it would cost you $60. For the rest of the month of October 2021, U.S. orders only, total delivered price $39.95. Go to my website, donkpresta.com, bibleprophecy.com, beautiful banner right up at the very top. Just click on it and order it and listen. It's going to blow you away how easily Mr. Pope's view which, by the way, was a view I once held, is completely, totally refuted. I hope you'll consider our appeal that we have given. I have given this morning in light of our shortfall, financial shortfall. Please keep us in your prayers. Help us out if you can. Thanks for joining me. You have a fantastic weekend. Be safe. I'll see you on Monday.